I'm Master Cicerone Neil Witte. I am the lead trainer for Cicerone Certification Program, and I'm going to be doing the Tasting Together session for you today. Uh, again, good to see everybody here. Uh, this is a this has been a cool ongoing uh, weekly event that Pat has been doing up until now. Uh, where late in the day on a Wednesday at 4 p.m. Central Time, uh, he'll take a particular beer style, uh, take the time to sit down, drink a beer, talk about that beer, talk about the beer style, history, ingredients, uh, kind of have fun with it. And, you know, so give everybody an opportunity to share a beer together while we're all sitting at home and learn a little bit about that particular beer. Uh, it's been, you know, actually really fun to watch on my end too, because there's always, uh, you know, a number of things that I pick up listening to Pat talk about these beers. Uh, he's done a fantastic job. Uh, hopefully I can live up to that a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of you saw me doing the CBS prep talks, uh, the, uh, 12 week session that we did there our six 12 session session over six weeks a while back. Uh, I'm sure I've got some of the same folks sitting here watching now. Uh, and so, you know, I just want to say welcome. If you've been here before, if you were here last week, Pat did pairing American IPA and blue cheese last week. So if you sat in on that, welcome back. If you haven't been here before, welcome to you as well. Uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, you know, we're going to be tasting through uh, German Weiss beer today. Um, so uh, hopefully all of you have selected a German Weiss beer. Uh, if you don't have a German Weiss beer, that's cool. You can still follow along uh, and hopefully get some good takeaways. Um, uh, but, you know, if you do have one, Go ahead and share. I see a lot of people sharing which one they are drinking. I've seen a couple of people, actually several people, uh, talk about the one that I'm going to be drinking today as well. The Wein Stefaner Hefeweiss beer, uh, one of the originals uh, from uh, the oldest continuously operating brewery in the world since 1040. Unbelievably long time that brewery's been around. Um so uh, just as a couple of notes, uh, in the weeks coming up, uh, we've got several more of these sessions. We're going to keep doing these for a while. Um, Pat is going to be back next week, July 15th, Wednesday, 4 p.m. Central Time. He's going to be talking about American Pale Ale. Uh, and then the following week, July 22nd, I'll be back again uh, to talk to you about Belgian Golden Strong Ale, and uh, you'll get a good kind of in-depth take on that beer for me uh, because I have uh, a little bit of a history with that style personally, having worked for uh, the company that makes the benchmark of that style. So that's going to be a fun one. Um, the next week after that, July 29th, Pat will be back again, and he'll be talking about pairing beer with spicy foods. So this is the first time that he's going to make a departure from uh, focusing on a particular beer style. Uh, last week, he, uh, he did the first one that kind of departed from just purely talking about a style where he talked about pairing American IPA and blue cheese. Good session. If you, uh, if you missed that, you can find that on the YouTube channel there. Uh, that you're, you're all on the YouTube channel right now. So click on that subscribe button uh, and then you can go back and watch any of the past sessions that Pat's done. For that matter, you can watch all my old CBS prep talk sessions from a few months ago. The last one that I want to alert you about four weeks from now, August 5th, uh, Pat will again be talking about, he's going to be doing a little bit, uh, something a little bit different. He's going to be taking an exercise out of our Road to Cicerone books, the, out of the German beer style book. And he's going to be talking about tasting wit beer, Belgian wit beer up against American wheat beer. Sorry, I, I said German style book. Uh, that is out. It's, it's a version of the side by side out of one of our style books. Uh, 
the style discrimination uh, exercise, he's going to be comparing those two styles. So that should be really fun to talk about two uh, similar but still quite different styles of wheat beer. Um, so that's on August 5th, Wednesday, 4 p.m. Central Time, Wednesday, 4 p.m. Central for all these. So uh, come on back, keep coming back and watch these. So uh, it's been a ton of fun for me. Uh, so again, hit that subscribe button, access all the old ones. Uh, and there's a ton of other really cool Cicerone content there as well. So uh, like I said, we're going to be talking about German Weiss beer today. Um, this is a really cool style. It's a fun style. It's a summery style. I mean, I don't know what the weather is like for all of you. I see people from all over the country, probably from other countries as well. Uh, you might have different weather than I do. But I'm in Kansas City, and it is hot and steamy. Uh, it's miserable outside. And, uh, you know, German Weiss beer is a really good, summery, refreshing beer for weather like this. Uh, there's a lot of really cool things to discuss about this beer, too. Uh, so we're going to dive into all this stuff. Um, you know, again, I'm drinking. Uh, I haven't popped it yet, and I'll explain why. Uh, but I've got the Weinstefaner Hefeweizen. Uh, there's some other classic examples that uh, Beer Judge Certification Program lists, including Schneiderweiss, which is considered to be uh, one of the originals, really kind of the original modern uh, German wheat beer. Uh, Eyinger Brauweiss is another classic example that's widely available. Uh, Pollen or Hefeweizen Naturtrub is another good one, too. Um, so, you know, regardless of what you're drinking, let us know about it. Um, so, uh, the reason why I haven't cracked mine open yet is because, uh, this is one beer that has, you know, a little bit of a unique, uh, pouring. So this is a, typically a beer that's served, um, in, out of a bottle. Now you can find plenty of, of uh, Hefeweizens and even classic German, uh, German Weiss beers that are served on draft. Uh, but if you, you know, if you're in Germany and you're drinking a lot of these beers, you'll find that most of them are served from a half liter bottle. Um, and they are served in a very particular glass, uh, the uh, Weiss beer glass. This is a good example of one right here. So uh, I wanted to be able to pour it uh, in front of you guys just to show you, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, what you do to pour the beer, uh, put a little pressure on myself so I don't screw it up in front of everybody. Um, but, uh, you know, the style of glass is very distinctive. So when you, uh, if you're traveling around in Germany, especially, and you're drinking uh, Weiss beer, you will always get it in one of these glasses. You won't ever get it in any other glass. Uh, and you won't get any other beer in this glass either. So this is, this is the glass for German Weiss beer and for no other beer. And you won't find in, you know, you're not going to find any other glass used for it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's usually got a pretty, you know, pretty firm, broad base, narrow midsection, and then it opens up at the top and it usually has some type of, you know, rather bulbous top. This one is a, doesn't have a really big bulb. Some of them have almost like a big ball shape on the top. It, it can jut out quite a bit, uh, but it has some kind of broader opening near the top. Um, so they're usually half liter or a little bit more. Um, so half liter on this comes up to about here. And that leaves room for a nice, uh, fluffy, big head on top. Um, so, you know, the way this is poured is you pour it to maximize the head. So this is one of the styles of beer where you expect a rather large collar of foam on top. And in addition, this, uh, this particular one, the Hefeweizen or Hefeweiss beer, uh, and I'll explain a little bit about the terminology um, in, in a few minutes here. Uh, but the hefe means yeast and that means it's unfiltered. Uh, it's bottle conditioned and it has some yeast sediment at the bottom. Typically with bottle conditioned beers, uh, there, uh, we're decanting the beer from the yeast at the bottom of the bottle. 
Uh, and in a service situation, you'd be leaving that yeast in the bottle for the customer. And if the customer decides they want that yeast served on top there, you know, they can certainly serve it or, or you can serve it for them. But by default, uh, we're usually leaving that yeast behind. Now with this particular beer, the default service is that we're pouring the yeast on top. Uh, so that's, that's very traditional. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take my Cicerone opener and pop this thing open and I'll pour it here kind of try and do it high up this is a little awkward to get it on camera but uh, we'll pour to max to get maximize the foam we got a lot of foam development there so yeah pour it a little fast and let that settle and one of the characteristics of this beer is that it has a lot of carbonation. So it's very effervescent. This one's been sitting on my desk here in preparation for this for, you know, 15 minutes or so. I didn't want to be running at the last second. So it is, it's warmed up a little bit. And so I'm getting a nice bit of foam on there. So, uh, and you can see this is maybe a little bit more than I wanted, but this will settle out quite nicely. And then I've got a little bit of beer down in the bottom. So I'm going to let this settle here while I talk about it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to swirl that around. Uh, and, and then I'm going to dump that on top. And you'll be able to see how all of that falls down through. Um, and it's kind of a beautiful sight, really. Um, but while I'm letting this foam settle out a little bit more, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the beer. So uh, obviously, uh, so this is, vice means white. And white is a term used uh, for wheat beers. Um, so whenever I talk about German beer, I always talk about the terminology and learning certain German vocabulary words. If you can learn a handful of German vocabulary words, you're going to you're going to be a lot better off in understanding German beer. So Weiss, as it's spelled on this bottle here, W-E-I-S-S, -S, that means white. And that's what is uh, that's the term used for wheat beers. It's also used in Belgium for wheat beers. The term wit means white. Uh, so because it has and that that is reference to a beer that has wheat in it. Wheat is a high pro has a lot of protein in it and it lends itself to making a rather hazy beer. And oftentimes in conjunction with uh, a golden malt, like a Pilsner malt, that wheat and that haziness will produce almost a white color. And that's, that's where that term comes from. So anytime you hear someone talking about a white beer or a vice beer, that's a beer that has wheat in it. So, uh, a German Weiss beer is a German wheat beer. Uh, and then there's another term that's Weizen, W-E-I-Z-E-N. Weizen means wheat. So these can be used interchangeably. Um, and typically, and, and so this one here is a Hefe Weiss beer. Hefe means yeast. So this means that it has some yeast in it. It's bottle condition and it's quote unquote unfiltered. I'm sure there's some type of filtration process that happens, but there's it's it's hazy and it has uh, and it has a yeast sediment in it. Uh, so there's other variants of this, but this is probably the most common is the Hefeweizen beer, also known as Hefeweizen. Um, so uh, while I'm talking about that, I the, the foam collapsed on that a little bit, kind of subsided a little bit, not totally collapsed. So you can see I'm swirling that around. I'm kind of rousing up that yeast. And then I'm going to hold it up so you can see, pour that on top. And you can see how that just kind of falls right through. And you've got a nice hazy beer. You can see right there. Mmm, smells wonderful. All right, that's great. Um, 
fabulous beer. Um, I'll talk about flavor profile here coming up, but I, I want to talk a little bit about the history. And I kind of got uh, on a little bit of a tangent about the terminology, but it's important to understand that terminology. Uh, and because, you know, when we're talking about vice beer, we're talking about wheat beer. And so looking at the history of brewing with wheat, we can trace that almost all the way back to some of the original uh, beers that were produced in ancient Samaria. Uh, we can trace that back almost 6,000 years, uh, the use of wheat in beer, but it's really kind of the genetic predecessors of wheat that they were using. Things like einkorn, emmer, and spelt uh, were, have been uncovered in, in some of these archeological excavations. Um, but uh, Bavarian wheat, like we're talking about today, German, uh, specifically Bavarian in southern Germany, which is where this style originates, uh, this has origins back to the early 1500s. Um, and, you know, there's, a, there's some interesting stories uh, from, you know, uh, how this beer was popular and who was brewing it. Um, there were a couple of... Uh, couple of family names that are associated with the early history of, of wheat beer and top fermented wheat beer in Germany. So when I say top fermented, I'm talking basically about ales versus lagers, because in Germany, lager beer uh, has, has been the, you know, for centuries, the main brewing tradition. Um, <clears throat> so uh, these cup, there's, a couple of families that figure fairly prominently in the early history. One is the, uh, the Wittelsbach family, and they were uh, basically the ruling family uh, in around this time in the 1500s in Bavaria. And they had given, uh, granted exclusive rights to brew uh, top fermenting wheat beer to another family, the Degensburg family. And they gave them the rights to do that because they didn't really think, you know, they didn't think they were giving them very much. But the Dagensburg family apparently sold quite a bit of this and it, uh, and it didn't sit very well with the Wittelsbach family. Uh, and the Wittelsbach family essentially uh, condemned the use of, of wheat in brewing shortly thereafter and, and declared them as uh, not being compliant with the German purity law, the, what we now know as the Reinheitsgebot. Uh, the German Reinheitsgebot stated that uh, you could only use three ingredients in beer, and that was barley, hops, and water. They didn't really fully understand yeast yet, so that was added later on. Um, but because they were using wheat, uh, the Wittelsbach family said that this doesn't really comply and we don't condone it. Uh, but because of the rules back then, uh, they weren't really prepared to uh, completely forbid them from, from making it. So the Degensburg family uh, had exclusive rights to this for a long time, but then, uh, uh, the, the last heir to the name of Degensburg, uh, died without any will and the rights automatically passed to the ruling family back to the Wittelsbach family. So they, uh, by some accident got those rights back. Um, and so the Wittelsbach family, uh, got that in, in the early 1600s. And they grew it into a really popular style of beer, even more popular than it had been. Um, and so, you know, they had exclusive rights for a good 200, 250 years. In the late 1800s, they sold uh, the exclusive rights to Georg Schneider. So that was in 1872. Um, and largely, they, they sold it to Georg Schneider largely because it was falling out of popularity. Pilsner beer was started. Pilsner beer and and blonde lagers were were, were had taken over Europe basically, um, and top fermented wheat beer just wasn't popular anymore. Uh, so uh, they uh, sold the rights to the Schneider family, and so this is really considered to be the beginning of uh, modern Weiss beer, uh, because the Schneider family and I saw a couple people drinking uh, Schneider Weiss. This is considered to be kind of the original. Uh, modern version of German vice beer. Um, so Schneider kind of steered this beer through several decades of sluggish sales uh, and then emerged in the, the 1960s again to uh, kind of a revival of the style. In the 1960s, it uh, you know 
sales surged all of a sudden and and became a really popular beer. And now it's it's one of the most popular beers in Germany right now, popular beer styles. Um, so just about anywhere you go in Germany, you can find uh, a Weiss beer of some sort, typically a Hefeweizen or some, one or more of the other variants. So you may be wondering, uh, you know, why they, people have been allowed to brew this beer for so long in Germany because the Reinheitsgebot uh, really limits the use of uh, the use of ingredients to barley, hops, yeast, and water. Uh, well, you know, there's a couple different versions of, originally of the Reinheitsgebot. The Bar Bavarian version uh, in early days uh, allowed for the use of wheat and rye in top fermenting beers. And that Bavarian version has really been as Germany reformulated and, and throughout their history, uh, you know, this uh, law has adapted quite a bit. Um, and that's always kind of remained an exception, the use of wheat in top fermenting beers. So the recipe uh, for this beer uh, is uh, unique. And some of it is, is mandated by law. So uh, the, by law, uh, anything labeled as Weiss beer in Germany has to use at least 50% malted wheat in the grain bill. Uh, although most of the traditional Weiss beers that you see, the Hefeweizens especially, uh, use uh, right around two thirds wheat malt um, in the grain bill. The, the balance of that would be Pilsner malt, typically. Um, so again, uh, wheat has a high protein content. So uh, that is largely what you're seeing uh, from the haze. You probably noticed before I even poured that yeast on top there, it was already fairly hazy. Uh, and, and so that's, you know, that's from that extra protein that you get from the wheat. Um, the... The protein also aids in head retention. So I had that big, thick, fluffy head on top. Uh, and that's uh, also, uh, you know, one of the benefits of, of that high protein content. Um, and the wheat is going to have uh, a very mild flavor. It's going uh, it's gonna to be very complementary to that Pilsner malt flavor. That Pilsner malt flavor is going to give you uh, more, kind of a bread-like or a cracker-like malt flavor, but the wheat is going to add more of a bread or bread flour kind of flavor, uh, kind of a pillowy flour-like malt flavor. Um, and wheat does have a tendency to, to lighten the overall flavor of malt flavor of the beer as well. Uh, so that's a little bit about the, uh, the malt bill. Uh, when we talk about hops, hops are not really a major player here. Um, you typically uh, are not going to see any type of aroma or flavor hops. Uh, if you are detecting any type of aroma, uh, and it would have to be a very fresh version, um, if you're detecting any hop aroma, it would probably be noble hop aroma. Um, there'd be very low, uh, low to low medium bitterness. Um, and it's really just to help balance out uh, the sweet malt flavors that you get. Um, the big flavor driver in this beer is the yeast. And this is one of the most distinctive things about this style of beer. It uses a very particular yeast strain that uh, produces two very important compounds. One is uh, an ester, and another one is a phenol. So if you sat in the CBS prep talks, I talked about both of these a little bit. Esters and phenols are these two different classes of aroma compounds. Uh, esters are produced by all ale yeast. Phenols are produced by a, a, select, uh, a select number of, of ale strains. So not all ale strains are going to produce phenols, but some of them will. So esters generally are described as having a fruity characteristic. Um, and there's one particular ester that a Hefeweizen or a Weiss beer yeast strain uh, is going to produce. It's called isoamyl acetate. Uh, and isoamyl acetate smells like bananas. 
Uh, and then there's one particular phenol that it's going to produce, and it's called 4-vinylguaiacol. And that smells like cloves. So this is really kind of the hallmark of the flavor profile of German Weiss beer is banana ester and clove phenol. Banana clove is what you should expect whenever you stick your nose into a German Weiss beer. Um, and in the right proportions uh, and when it's fresh, man, it's a really pleasant thing. So there's a there's a little bit of a you know the process is fairly traditional. Uh, historically, decoction mashing was used uh, to produce this, these beers, uh, but modern versions, most modern versions, don't use decoction. Um, there's not a lot of decoction brewing uh, taking place at a lot of bigger brewers these days. Uh, I don't want to say that across the board, but uh, decoction is not used as much in this beer as it was historically. So if you don't know what decoction is, it's a method of raising the temperature of the mash, whereby you rest at one mash temperature and then you remove part of the mash, bring it to a boil, and then return it to the mash and it brings the temperature up of the mash to a higher level. So then you can produce a different mixture of of fermentable and non-fermentable sugars. Um, and that process uh, develops a little bit richer, fuller malt flavor, typically. So let's talk a little bit about the appearance and the flavor. So we, you know, we've got straw to golden in color. Uh, two to six SRM is the BJCP guidelines on that. Uh, Large fluffy head. This one is uh, still got a little bit of head retention there, even though the that the the big amount has diminished after I've taken several sips. Um, cloudy, especially the unfiltered version. Now there are some filtered versions as well. We'll talk about some of those variants here in just a second. Um, and you know, so that's a little bit about the appearance. But the nose, the first thing that you get in this is that banana clove character, those fermentation characteristics. That is the hallmark of this beer. And it's what sets this beer apart from a lot of other wheat beers produced around the world. Um, uh, and I think it's, it's worth noting that the term Hefeweizen uh, is used by some American brewers for wheat beers that are not German Weiss beers. So it can be kind of confusing understanding uh, the nomenclature and how sometimes it can be misused is, is, is kind of an important thing. Uh, so the American style wheat ale does not feature those big banana clove characteristics that the German vice beer does. Although there are a handful of American breweries making American wheat ale that call those beers Hefeweizen. Uh, I would say inaccurately. It's a, it's kind of misleading, honestly. Um, you know, I prefer, and you know, BJCP prefers to call those American wheat ale. Um, so uh, be aware of that. Um, this, uh, so you know, this particular beer, the German version, should have those big banana clove characteristics, but other wheat beers, you shouldn't expect those. So again, low to no hop aroma and flavor. The, the malt character is, is sweet, bread-like, and bread flour-like. Moderate alcohol content. So this isn't a high alcohol beer. It doesn't have a warming alcoholic uh, content. Uh, 4.3 to 5.6% ABV is the BJCP range on this. Low bitterness, 8 to 14 IBUs. That's just enough bitterness to balance that sweet malt character. So it, it does focus on the sweetness. Uh, that malt sweetness is the prominent flavor outside of that banana clove. Uh, but despite it being sweet, it doesn't finish sweet. Uh, it finishes dry. And that part of that is aided by the high carbonation. That high carbonation, that effervescence helps to, helps to produce a nice, clean, dry finish. And it makes it more refreshing and uh, really nice for summertime drinking.
so the service of this beer uh, in the United States, you may see it often served with a slice of lemon. This is not traditional. I think that's worth mentioning. Uh, in Germany, uh, it is often, uh, you know, when I, 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 sh I should say uh, a couple things about this. When you read German beer writers talk about this beer, uh, they'll, they'll always say that people will scoff at you for asking for a lemon, and this may very well be true. Uh, although, I will say that this does kind of conflict with my own personal experience. Uh, many years ago, in the early 90s, I traveled around Germany by train, and I drank a whole lot of Hefeweizen. And everywhere I went, it was offered with a lemon. Now, I don't know if they were doing that because they knew I was an American and I would probably want it with a lemon, and this is quite possible. Um, but uh, it's not unheard of to have it served with a lemon. Although, uh, you know, beer scholars and people who study beer and know beer in Germany uh, will insist that it is not traditional to be served with a lemon. So let's talk about some of the variants that you'll see on, uh, on, on this beer. So obviously this one is Hefeweiss beer, so yeast wheat. Uh, this is the unfiltered version. There's also, so this is bottle conditioned, uh, unfiltered. Uh, there's also a fully filtered version called a Kristallweizen. And the Kristallweizen is not bottle conditioned. Uh, because it's not bottle conditioned, it's going to have a little bit shorter shelf life uh, and, uh, you know, a little bit more prone to oxidation. Um, but it'll be fully clear but it'll still have that banana clove character. It has generally the same malt bill and the same makeup as a Hefeweizen. It just uh, doesn't have uh, the bottle conditioning and it's fully filtered and clear. Um, and then there's a Dunkelsweizen. So Dunkel means dark. And so this is, uh, this is a beer that has a very similar formulation again. Uh, it needs to have at least 50% wheat malt by law. Um, and oftentimes it does have around 50% wheat malt, but the balance, instead of being Pilsner malt, is often some type of other darker malt, typically Munich malt. Um, it could include some other uh, malts as well, uh, but Munich malt is usually the bulk of the balance of that malt bill. So the Munich malt is going to give it a little darker color and a, and a different malt flavor, so it's going to feature more kind of bread crust and toasty malt flavors. And then there's another version that's called a Weizenbach. So if you know what a Bach beer is, a Bach is a strong lager beer. And a Weizenbach then would be a strong wheat beer. Um, and so the, the cutoff for alcoholic content for a Bach beer uh, is 6.3%. So we're we're above 6.3% with a, a Weizenbach. So those are some common variants you'll see out there. So this is a really good uh, beer for pairing with food as well. It's very versatile. Uh, it's got a lot going on. There's a lot there you can work with. Um, from an intensity standpoint, uh, it's relatively light bodied and the flavors are a little bit more on the delicate side. So uh, we're gonna be looking for foods that, uh, that are a little bit more delicate and can match in intensity. Uh, so this isn't something we're gonna be pairing with really rich foods. Um, the flavors, the main flavors that we're working with uh, from a, uh, flavors that we would be looking for when we want something to complement those flavors uh, complementary flavors uh, for the sweet, bready, or bread flour malt flavor. Those bready malt flavors are something we would look for for complementary flavors. Uh, we'd also be looking to complement uh, those spicy and fruity fermentations, fermentation aromas. That banana clove is something we can work with quite a bit. If we're looking for things to contrast with this, a great point of contrast is that sweetness, that malt sweetness. Uh, so sometimes if you get like something that is a little salty or even a little bit spicy, that kind of capsaicin spice, 
you can uh, contrast that with the sweetness of this beer. Uh, this beer has a high effervescence, which uh, gives it some more versatility. It gives it the ability, gives it a lot of cutting power. So you can cut through fatty or oily characteristics in certain foods. Uh, so you've got uh, you've got a lot of versatility here. Um, some suggestions for pairings with this, uh, you know, there's a lot of good cheeses that could go with this. Uh, one that uh, uh, Randy Mosher always talks about is is pairing this with uh, a burrata. A uh, burrata cheese is uh, it's kind of like a, a a prepared type of mozzarella that has uh, uh, a, a, like a, a richer mozzarella on the outside with a little kind of creamier cheese and cream on the inside. Uh, it's a really delicious preparation of cheese. Uh, and Randy talk, Randy Mosher talks about this beer uh, pairing with that and producing uh, a classic flavor of what he calls peaches and cream. Uh, so that's that kind of sense of recreating a classic flavor in your mind by pairing uh, beer and food together. Uh, mozzarella or any type of uh, fresh cheese uh, is gonna uh, is gonna be really good with this beer. Uh, cheese curds. Um, there's a local company here in Kansas City that makes cheese curds uh, that are fantastic with this beer. Uh, they're these little kind of, you know, these fresh cheddar cheese curds that have a little saltiness to them and this little snap. And that saltiness is that perfect contrast for that sweet malt flavor. And they just go perfect together. This could also go good with a, a young Gouda. Uh, you wouldn't want to go too old with your Gouda because then it gets really rich and it might, uh, might be a little bit of an intensity mismatch, but a young Gouda would be really nice. Maybe even a young Gruyere. Um, some other light foods that might go well, uh, when I'm thinking of salads, for instance, something with a light citrus in it, uh, that citrus character to kind of match with that, uh, the fruitiness, um, and, uh, something with maybe a vinaigrette dressing. Uh, those are some of the things I'm thinking about with a salad, uh, seafood or fish. Um, you know, I, I think this would go good with sushi, uh, could also go with uh, some type of poached or sautéed white fish uh, with a variety of different sauces. It could be something with like lemon and herb uh, or some type of butter sauce or garlic sauce. Uh, so these, you know, a lot of it is, it, you know, there's a wide range of different sauces and, and spicing that you could use or herbs that you could use with that. But uh, some type of mild white fish in that preparation, keeping it mild, that poaching or sautéing. <clears throat> um, some Indian food I think would go really good with this uh, tikka masala would be you know a, an obvious choice I think uh, you know the creaminess of a tikka masala sauce uh, would match well with this uh, and also that that Indian spice uh, would go would be a natural match with that clove and that spiciness a spicy phenol character or if you wanted to go in the spicy direction with Indian food, a vindaloo, which is a, always a really spicy dish, uh, vindaloo, that, that spiciness could be offset by that sweet malt flavor of the beer. Uh, so that could be a really nice match as well. Uh, I'm also thinking of a curry, like a Thai curry maybe. Uh, that spice, uh, again, uh, that curry spice could be very complementary to the, that phenolic spiciness from fermentation. And any type of heat you might get from that curry would be balanced out by that sweet malt flavor. Um, and then, you know, other ingredients that you might find in some of those, like a, like a Thai basil, that herbal characteristic could really match very nicely in with those fermentation aromas. This is also a beer that I think of when I'm thinking about breakfast or brunch. Um, you know, this, this is one of those beers, like if, if it's, you know, if I'm at brunch on a Saturday morning and I feel like drinking a beer, you know, there's, there's some beers that just work really well in that context and some beers that, that don't, honestly, this is one of those beers that I think works really well. 
it just goes good with a, a variety of different preparations of eggs, uh, you know, a number of different preparations of omelet or a frittata it would be fantastic with this. Um, you know, and this could, this could also serve as a great back for your Bloody Mary, honestly. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. This beer is tasting really good. I hope you're enjoying yours there. I see a lot of discussion here. Um, that is, uh, that's all I've got to discuss about, you know, the wide world of German Weiss beer. So I'm going to, I've got several questions here. If you have questions, go ahead and post them up there. I'm going to work my way through and try to get to as many of these as I can. Um, so, uh, let's see here. Is loss of effervescence a sign of an older bottle? Um, you know, loss of effervescence isn't really typically a sign of an older bottle. Uh, that's a sign of some type of compromised closure. So, you know, if you've got some kind of bad crown on there, something happened that allowed that gas to escape. Um, I've had some really, uh, like fantastically old beers that were still carbonated. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily equate those two. Um, let's see. Um, in Jeff Allworth's book, The Beer Bible, it mentions Schneider uses open fermentation. Mind expanding on the benefits of that. Yeah, so uh, open fermentation uh, is sometimes discussed uh, as a, a traditional method uh, for producing this beer. And, you know, in the, depending on the shape and the size of that fermenter, it can uh, encourage the formation of more esters. Um, so that's kind of the thought of that is, uh, you're going to get a little bit different mix of esters. Um, and so, because, you know, the dynamics of not being under pressure, um, yeast is going to act differently under different conditions. And depending on, uh, what strain of yeast you're using, uh, those fermentation conditions are going to dictate what types of esters and what amounts of different esters it's going to produce. Uh, so that open fermenter is all part of that, of their kind of recipe formulation and producing that right mix of esters and phenols in this case too. So that kind of banana clove mix, they're getting, that's part of the formula in getting that right mix for them. Um, Let's see, which vice beer do you think has the most isoamyl? Um, you know, I don't know if I can speak to the one that has the most isoamyl. This comes from Max Finance. That, thanks, Max. Um, uh, I will say the one that, uh, that has the most phenolic character in my mind is that Franzis Connor. I don't know if anybody out there is drinking Franzis Connor, but that's the one that has the really super pronounced uh, four vinyl glycol clove character. Um, you know, this Weinstefaner actually has a really nice isoamyl acetate character uh, right here, but I don't know if I've really compared them based on that particular component. Uh, so if anybody has their own input as to which one they think, so Max, I know you know a little bit about beer. Maybe you can tell us what you think. Um, are all recipes for this style essentially identical? 50 plus percent wheat, minimal hops, specified yeast, and flavor comes down to the brewing process. Well, I think, you know, in a way, um, you're going to have some variations in there. Um, you know, brewing process is a lot of where some variation is going to occur in there. The strain of yeast, they aren't all using the exact strain of yeast. Um uh, you know, the stuff like open fermenters or closed fermenters, are they using decoction or not? Um, you know, what percentage of wheat? Is it 50? Is it 60? Is it two thirds? Uh, you know, what's the source of their Pilsner malt? Who's the malt, uh, you know, who, who actually malted that, uh, 
malted their grains. Uh, there's a number of different things. And you could really say that about a lot of different styles of beer, uh, for that matter. You could say that about German pills, you know, very similar, uh, very similar malt bill for from one Pilsner to another, very similar recipe formulation, but the differences are going to come down to some subtle things that the brewer is doing and some subtle recipe tweaks. Um, and, you know, that's not uncommon with German brewing. When you look at German brewing tradition versus a lot of other countries, uh, German brewing tradition is uh, tends to conform fairly closely to their predetermined idea of what that beer should be. So uh, there's not a, a huge variation within a certain style. So one German hell is to another, you're not going to find a wide variance. Uh, one, uh, you know, one German vice beer to another, you're not going to find a huge variance. Although I would say that within this style versus some of the lager styles, you'll find probably more variance here than you would with like a Pils or a Hellas. Um, still waiting for Max to tell us. Oh, here we go. Max says, I always think of Vine Stefaner as pretty high isoamyl example. Yep. Uh, also mentions Live Oak Hefe. Live Oak, I think they're out of uh, Texas, I believe. Dallas, if I'm not mistaken. Um, all right. Cool. Max asked a question, and I had him answer it. Um, next question here. Uh, are Hefeweizen's, Hefeweiss beers lagered like other German styles? No, these are not lagered. So these aren't really treated like lager beers. So there are some top fermented beers uh, made, that are native to Germany that are kind of treated like lager beers and that they have an extended conditioning time. Um, those would be the Rhine River beers, uh, like Alt beer from Dusseldorf or Kölsch from Cologne. Uh, those would undergo what would be considered uh, to be a lagering period, but these, these are not. Any connection from the history of vice beer to the creation of Keller beer? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would say there's really not. Uh, you know, the creation of Keller beer is really just uh, Keller means cellar. And this is Keller beer is, is really just a, um, a lager beer that is consumed young, usually straight from the fermenter. Uh, and it's consumed young before the lagering period is, is finished. So uh, these are kind of two different traditions here. Um, having such a heavy wheat grain bill with a vice beer, I would worry more about a stuck mash. How do they do it with 50% wheat? Well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, in that question, if you don't understand the context of that question, uh, wheat, the grain, wheat does not have a husk, whereas barley does. And this is important when you're separating the wort from the grain in the loudering process, uh, because in the loudering process, you're relying on those intact husks to act as a type of filter, but also to help keep your mash from getting really gummy. Because if it gums up too much, then the, your sparge water, your water won't flow through the grain to extract the sugar. So you get what you call a stuck mash. Um, you know, another grain that's notorious for uh, causing a stuck mash would be rye. Um, but if you use a high percentage of wheat, you do run the risk of having a stuck mash. Uh, so, you know, you're relying on the husk of the barley malt to... Uh, aid in that filtration. Um, and as I understand it, uh, you know, some brewers, a lot of American brewers, if you have a high percentage of, of adjunct grain like wheat or rye uh, that has the potential for sticking your mash, a lot of brewers will put rice hulls in. And this is just a, they're kind of just a empty hull that don't have, you know, bags of these hulls that don't have any 
flavor. They don't contribute anything to the character of the beer. They just aid in the loudering process to help keep your mash from getting stuck. And my understanding is that rice hulls do not go against the um, Reinheitsgebot, although I can't say if there are any of the big traditional brewers using rice hulls in that context. That would be one way to do it. Um, but uh, I think they're just relying on uh, getting the proper grind and keeping husks intact uh, so they can get a good louder. And they might just have slower louders than uh, what you would expect from a 100% barley malt mash. Are there any U.S. breweries that produce a good example of a classical German-style Hefeweizen? Uh, yeah, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of them, uh, you know, uh, you know, who always, I always thought, uh, you know, Gordon Biersch always did a fantastic job. Uh, we don't really have them around anymore. Um, uh, Live Oak out of Texas that Max mentioned, I, that's one of the beers that I really remember from them, uh, as being a really fantastic example. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, and there's countless just small local examples in different places that I've been. Uh, those are a couple that, that particularly stand out. Um, let's see. Is it possible to use unmalted wheat in this beer? Um, it is possible to use unmalted wheat. Although if you're using unmalted wheat, uh, you are less likely to be uh, unmalted wheat does hasn't uh, you know since it's not malted, you haven't really gelatinized those starches, so you haven't started that kind of breakdown process, uh, and so the starches are not as accessible to uh, converting to sugar in the mash. Um, so, uh, unmalted wheat is going to give you, uh, less extract, um, and it'll, it'll give you a little bit more of a, of a starchy haze. Um, and, uh, yeah, so you might not get quite the desired result. You might end up with, uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit different beer than, than what you'd expect. Um, and, if it's a German brewery, uh, the Reinheitsgebot, or the the exception to the Reinheitsgebot, spe uh, specifies uh, malted wheat, and I don't believe that unmalted wheat would fit the bill for that 50% mark. Are Dunkless Weiss beers less carbonated than Hefeweizen beers? Um, I I would say they're, they are just about equally as effervescent. The ones I've had are very effervescent. Now, I can't speak for every single one of them, uh, but that is still a style of beer that you should expect to be very effervescent. Okay. Um, well, that gets me to the end of the questions. And so... I am going to take one more drink here. Cheers, all of you, for joining in. Uh, this has been a fun event. Uh, you know, join us next week. Pat Fahey is going to be back here uh, next week. He's going to be talking about American Pale Ale. Wednesday, July 15th, 4 p.m. Uh, following week, I will be back here talking about Belgian Golden Strong. I will be drinking Duval. Uh, and the week after that, on July 29th, Pat is going to be talking about pairing beer with spicy foods. And then the week after that, August 5th, uh, he's going to do a style discrimination exercise where he's going to compare wit beer, Belgian wit, with American wheat ale. So those are all going to be a ton of fun. And I hope to see you there. Thank you all for joining. Cheers, everybody.